So if you're dealing with significant blood sugar crashes and it's making life a little bit miserable for you, then in this video, I want to help you understand why is it that some people deal with blood sugar going too low and other people don't have that problem, but also why do these blood sugar dips affect some people much more than other people? It's a little bit crazy, really. You don't want to miss this. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So it was over on our video for five steps to improve insulin resistance that I think it was YouTube user HCS42D90B, something like that, that asked, what should I do if my blood sugar goes down when I cut sugar and carbs totally? I have anxiety about cutting them off, which might make me faint from low blood sugar. What do you recommend I do and what carbs should I eat when trying to lose weight? So user 42D90B, whatever that was, I don't know you and I don't know your situation, so I'm not giving you specific advice. I'm not a doctor that wants to give anybody some medical advice, but I want to give some insights into this question because we hear this a lot and there's a variety of scenarios that can go on and it can be a little bit complicated as far as understanding what's creating these low blood sugar type reactions because some people will feel lousy like this here. Some people will have dizzy spells. Some people can go into a depression or just feel very horrible and have no energy and and have a variety of things that can come up when blood sugar goes too low. So the first thing that we want to look at when we're looking at these blood sugar crashes is we actually want to see where blood pressure is. Because when we're looking at blood pressure, we're basically looking at the minerals in the system, but we're also looking at where blood sugar is, maybe protein a little bit, and also filth. So there's a number of things that can basically thicken up the blood and raise the pressure needed to push that through the system. So when blood pressure is very low, that's an indication that there's not a lot of stuff in there. And the majority of that stuff is often minerals that need to help the body function the way that it's supposed to function. So you can just look at your blood pressure at home. You can pick up a blood pressure cuff at most pharmacies for $30 or $40. And you want to look at your blood pressure at least two hours after a meal. It shouldn't be first thing in the morning. It should be after a meal, but you want to wait at least two hours. And if that systolic number, which is the top number, is below 112, that's a really strong indication that the minerals in this system are very low. And so what that means is when we're looking at low minerals, when minerals go low, if you have blood sugar high enough, that can buffer the low minerals and the body can function the way that it's supposed to function. If blood sugar goes too low, as long as there's enough minerals there, that can kind of buffer the system and allow the body to function. So either of those being substantial enough can help the person feel and function well. But when both of them go low, that's where trouble really comes in, where we see a lot of dizzy spells, we see a lot of depression, we can even see things like seizures and severe issues like that when both blood sugar and minerals go very low at the same time. So a lot of people feel like, well, if somebody's just going to faint or pass out when these things go too low, it's almost like the body just kind of shutting down. Look, we don't have enough stuff to make everything work. We're just going to shut it all down until we can get some more resources and allow this person to function like a human being. So when we're looking at blood sugar that's not staying on an even keel, the buffers really become important. So if you see that low blood pressure number, then that could tell you that, wow, I don't have a lot of minerals in the system. So when my blood sugar crashes, it's going to affect me much more than someone that has plenty of minerals and the body's functioning like it wants to function. So what it sounds like the person that was asking me about, hey, I'm trying to lower carbs to lose weight. That's what a lot of people want to do to lose weight. And it makes sense because when you lower carbs, that allows insulin to come down. And when insulin is lower, it allows the body to access stored fat and burn that for fuel. As long as insulin is high, the body can't access that stored fat. So a lot of people want to lower their carbs in order to lose weight or maybe even correct other problems and health issues that are coming from high carbohydrate diets that are creating insulin going too high and creating a lot of inflammation. So there's a lot of reasons that someone might want to lower their carbs. But again, if someone's having blood sugar crashes, 
so they're gonna try and lower these carbs. Well, if there's not enough minerals in the system and you make these carbs too low, well, that can create a problem where there's not enough minerals and there's not enough blood sugar and the person can really just feel kind of lousy. We don't like to see people using like a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet where they're really taking out all carbohydrates if their minerals are too low. So if we see someone with really low blood pressure, like 99 over 60 or something, we don't like to see them use a ketogenic diet for some reasons that I'll explain now. If a person already has these low mineral levels and we're looking at a low blood pressure individual, when they remove all the carbohydrates, well now there's not so much sugar in that bloodstream thickening up the blood. So that alone, the removal of those sugars and carbs can lower the blood pressure even further and make the person really feel lousy. But the bigger problem is the insulin response that can go on. And that's what we wanna look at when we're having spikes and crashes with blood sugar. Usually blood sugar crashes come from eating too many carbohydrates at once. So a person eats a large carbohydrate meal or maybe just a lot of sugar in that meal. It could just be like a little bit of candy. But if it's enough to create a big sugar spike, then that sugar spike is going to trigger a spike in insulin. And when that insulin goes really high, it's going to sweep out too much glucose too quickly and they get that sugar crash where everything goes down. So if a person's eating too many carbohydrates, that's usually where these sugar crashes come from. So a person's like, okay, I'm gonna reduce my carbohydrates so I don't create these spikes and crashes. But again, if minerals are too low, they're gonna feel lousy when blood sugar goes even a little bit lower because they don't have enough minerals in there to buffer those lower sugars. So we'll get to this insulin creating these sugar crashes in a second, but anytime someone's having sugar crash problems or hypoglycemic type issues, we really wanna look at why aren't there enough minerals in this system. And the biggest issue we need to look at are digestive malfunctions. So if a person has any digestive symptoms at all, like burping or bloating or constipation or diarrhea or acid reflux or nausea or indigestion or even skin or acne type issues, all of these are signs that digestion is not working correctly. So when we're eating food, our stomach should be making hydrochloric acid or HCL. And that stomach acid helps us acidify that food so that we can break it down and get all the nutrients out of that food. And then once the food is acidified, it leaves the stomach and comes down here into the duodenum. And that acidity in the duodenum triggers this gallbladder to squirt this alkaline bile down. And this bile helps us neutralize those acids that are coming from the stomach. The bile helps us emulsify or break down dietary fats so the body can use those dietary fats and also access fat soluble vitamins like A, E, D, and K. So all these things are really big. And what is really great about both of these things happening is the acidic product leaving the stomach meeting this alkaline bile, these opposite pHs colliding creates like this sizzle that really helps us bust the food apart and get all the minerals and nutrients out of that food. So the problem is, it's very common for someone not to be making enough stomach acid today for a wide variety of reasons. And if they're not making enough stomach acid, they're not really acidifying that food so that it can be broken down correctly. And another problem is that it's very common for someone's bile to become too thick and sticky to flow correctly. So then it's not coming down to help neutralize acids that are coming from the stomach. So there's a wide variety of issues that can create a problem because you need both of those sides of digestion working to really bust the food apart and get all the minerals out of that food. So that becomes the biggest, most common problem when someone's mineral levels are low. There's either HCL production is low or their bile is not flowing correctly. And either of those things or both of those things can restrict us from really getting all the nutrition out of the food that we're eating. So the next thing we wanna look at is a person's urine pH. So you can look at your urine pH at least two hours after a meal as well. And you can get these urinalysis dipsticks, testing strips at like health food stores or even on Amazon and stuff. And you just look at the pH of your urine. Now if the urine pH is like 6.2 or 6.3 or higher, that can be a really strong indication that insulin is almost acting like a bully. So when this person eats carbohydrates or sugars, the insulin is almost like too effective. It sweeps way too much sugar out of the bloodstream way too fast. So that can create these sugar crashes. So if a person has a high urine pH, 
they can take steps to lower that urine pH and sometimes that can improve that situation a little bit. Keep in mind this urine pH testing is not a diagnostic thing. This is not a medical fact. This is just something that we see a correlation to a lot. When we see people that are having hypoglycemic type reactions, a lot of times their urine pH is very high and if we could take steps to lower that urine pH, it can help the person feel and function a little bit better. Now, that's going to be a way to magnify this insulin response and create a harder crash. Now, another option is that if a person's more insulin resistant, they're leaning on that insulin resistance side where the cells are no longer really responsive to that insulin. This usually happens because a person's been eating too many carbohydrates too often for too long. Eventually, the cells just stop listening to that insulin. But when that's the case and the person's eating carbohydrates or sugar, then when the body makes insulin and it doesn't really do its job, the body's like, oh, well, I'll just make more insulin. I'm going to make more and more insulin. Eventually, the insulin goes very high and then it sweeps way too much sugar out. So a person could have a sugar crash from insulin being overreactive, but it can also create a sugar crash if a person's insulin is way too underactive and the body starts making more and more insulin and eventually it's like the person turned five furnaces on in the house and all of a sudden the house is way too hot. So that can happen with insulin if it's not working correctly in either direction. So one way to get an indication of this is to look at your fasting blood sugar. And if your fasting blood sugar is over 100, that's an indication that a person could be leaning more on that insulin resistance side. And if your fasting blood sugar is really low, like maybe in the 70s or like 71, 68, somewhere around there where it gets a little bit lower, that could be an indication that maybe insulin is working too aggressively. So again, these are not diagnostic things, but when we look at physiology in the body, we can get an idea of how things are operating and what steps might be most effective for that individual. But this can help us start to understand why do some people have an aggressive sugar crashing issue going on and other people don't have that. Well, if a person doesn't have enough minerals in the system, any dip in the blood sugar is going to hit them a lot harder than if they did have enough minerals in the system. And if somebody's insulin is acting overly aggressively or maybe they're leaning too insulin resistant, either way, that overpowering of insulin at any given time can also create a sugar crash. And again, if the minerals are lower, that's going to affect that person even more. So what do we want to do if we're dealing with this situation? Well, the first thing we want to look at is we want to fix any digestive malfunctions. If there's digestion is not working correctly and you can't get the minerals out of your food, you're going to have a hard time really raising the minerals in the system and increasing that buffering system that you really should have going on. The next thing we want to do is we want to reduce all high carbohydrate food, bread, rice, pasta, junk food, sugar, processed junk. We want to get rid of that completely because we don't want foods that are more likely to create a huge spike in blood sugar that's going to result in a sugar crash. So we want to get rid of those. I like for people to be able to eat things that they want to enjoy themselves from time to time, but if this is happening to you, you're not getting away with that. It's not going to work for you. So for now, you need to get rid of those foods completely. But that doesn't mean that you want to get rid of all carbs. You might not want to. Now, some people have the ability to go on like a keto or a carnivore diet where they're removing all those carbohydrates and when their body starts to make ketones, now the body has another fuel source so it can function correctly. And what's nice is they remove the spikes and they remove the crashes. When you remove those spikes in carbohydrate and blood sugar, then you remove the crashes in blood sugar. And so that's why some of these people improve greatly when they go on these types of diets. But some folks, when mineral levels are too low, are going to have a hard time adapting to that diet. And another problem is when we're looking at the insulin response, insulin goes very low on a no carbohydrate diet or a very low carbohydrate diet. And for some people, when insulin is very low, it will cause them to pee out even more minerals. So a person already has low minerals and they'll go on a ketogenic diet and bring insulin way down, which is really great for weight loss and it's really great for reducing inflammation and all these health problems that high insulin can create. But if a person's mineral levels are too low, that low insulin level for an extended period of time can cause them to pee out even more minerals and now they're really going to feel lousy. So we like to see people take steps to improve those mineral levels and lift those mineral levels and get to the point where they qualify to use a diet like that. 
In the meantime, we like to see people use what we call medium carb foods because a lot of people are like, well, what do I eat then? What do I eat if I can't eat high carbs and I feel lousy if I eat proteins and fats and stuff? A lot of people will gravitate towards eating higher carbohydrate foods because they don't feel good when they eat protein because they can't break it down. They're not making enough stomach acid. Or maybe they can't emulsify dietary fat, so if they have a higher fat meal with lower carbohydrates, they feel really lousy. So we wanna fix these digestive malfunctions first. And if you need to understand how to do that, chapters three and four of my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, kind of walk you through figuring out which aspects of digestion are not working correctly and steps you can take to help improve those. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below where you can get the whole thing totally for free and that'll walk you through that process. But while a person is taking steps to improve their digestion and their ability to get minerals out of their food and lift the minerals in the body, they can eat more of these medium carb foods, things like butternut squash or sweet potatoes or yams or Brussels sprouts or small amounts of fruit. All of these things can supply the body with some carbohydrates that it can use without creating such large amounts that you create that huge spike and a crash. So some people don't qualify to get rid of all of the carbs. They still need to have some carbohydrates, but if you eat real food sources of carbs that are in these lower carbohydrate categories that are not so high like rice and all this stuff, then a person can keep their blood sugar on a more even keel and not create such a spike and a crash. Another thing is you really wanna have protein at every meal. Protein going in with these carbohydrates can slow down how hard they hit the system. Without any protein, the carbs go in faster and create a bigger spike and of course a bigger crash. And some people can also use small amounts of fruit. If you have a lot of fruit, it kind of processes in the body just like sugar. So you don't want to have, well, I'm gonna have six bananas and I'm eating fruit so it's healthy. You're still eating a lot of sugar when you do that. But if you have smaller amounts of fruit, they can get away with that and they do well and it kind of supplies the body with some fructose which is processed a little bit differently than glucose and starches and such and that can help them feel and function a little bit better. I also have a lot of clients that um, maybe I'm between meals, maybe I feel like I'm going to crash a little bit. If they have very small amounts of fruit, it'll help get them through a tough spot. So I tell them like get those little cutie oranges like the little tangerine things and just have two of the wedges, only two of the wedges, not two of the cutie oranges, just two of the wedges, and that'll give you enough fuel to help you function and feel better to your next meal. You just don't wanna eat a lot of fruit at once because you can create that same spike and crash in blood sugar. And while you're working to improve these things, a person could also try to lift their mineral levels. You know, maybe they could use an unrefined salt. We like to see people use good unrefined salt that supplies more minerals than just a normal table salt would. And there's one salt, uh, it's by Celtic Sea Salt. And um, this is not a paid promotion for them. This is not a, a commercial for them. Uh, but they have a specific salt that's called Flower of the Ocean. And that seems to help people that have really low blood pressure more than the other ones. They just seem to feel better when they use this one. And I think the last time I talked about this salt that they went out of stock on Amazon for like months or something. I've seen it recently, so I think that they have it back in, in stock, but don't yell at me if you can't find it anywhere. Just using any type of unrefined salt can really be beneficial for a lot of people where their minerals are really low. You just want to get more of those minerals in the system. A person can also use supplements, and I'm not going to give you any specific supplement. You're going to have to do your research on that. In that book that I told you how to get for free, there's a chapter where I talk about different supplements that can help different types of imbalances. And, and one of those imbalances is an electrolyte deficiency where minerals are very low. So maybe you can find something in that book that could be beneficial to you as well. But you can see there's not going to be a simple answer for this. You need to look and see what's going on. What is my urine pH doing? What's my blood pressure doing? You're going to have to look at these things to get an idea of which steps are going to help you the most. Now, since digestive issues seem to be a very common problem with this, you can jump over right now and check out our video on 10 signs of low stomach acid to see if that might be part of what's contributing to the issue for you. I can't wait to hear about your results.